Um, yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> so that we can have a YouTube record of it for people who missed it today. Um, this is an intimate, uh, great conversation. It's a great conversation to have an opportunity to talk to someone who actually does ground reporting in this country, which is very rare. Who well, does ground reporting that is often very challenging to the establishment, anybody who's in power. It is a great opportunity to talk to someone who is a woman and does that kind of reporting. And, um, and it's a great opportunity to talk to Neha, who's funny and smart and <laughs> always fun to talk to. Uh, and incredibly insightful, wonderful journalist. So um, we're going to ask that you keep yourself on mute just in case, you know, you have traffic or you have dogs or, you know, family members uh, in the background who can speak freely. <laughs> and um, I'm just going to kick it off with one question. Please put your questions in the chat box. The chat box is right in the bottom of your screen. And then we'll call on you and you can, you know, ask the question the way you want to of Neha. Okay, so Neha, I'm going to go to the most difficult part of your recent experience, which is being stalked and threatened um, by a couple of men. I'm, I want you to talk about the incident. I don't want to frame it in any particular way. Um, but there was a clear um, connection between the journalism you do and the experience and the very scary experience you had. So I think I want, I'm asking that how safe is it really to do journalism that challenges the establishment or challenges the powers that be in this country today? Um, whether it's a Pegasus, whether it's what you personally experience in a very personal way, or it is regional journalists who are being killed in, you know, in the heartland in this country. Um, how safe is it, honestly, to actually do journalism? Uh, thank you, Lakshmi, for that question and very happy to be part of this. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, Lakshmi is... Uh, somebody who's always supported good journalism and, and I'm so happy that she's started the question with this because uh, I think, and like you said, Lakshmi, journalism is always supposed to be anti-establishment, right? So it's, it doesn't matter which political party is in power and it's not like uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, no, no establishment likes press freedom or wants a press which is robust or is critical because uh, uh, that is something the establishment, uh, establishment doesn't like. Uh, but I would like to say, uh, when I started journalism, my editors told me that each time you get a legal notice for a story that you have done, consider it as, as, a, as a badge of honor, you know, which means that somebody <laughs> has actually taken cognizance and is affected by it. I think what has changed in the last seven years is the kind of uh, like the growing attacks uh, on journalists and, and the fact that the, there are a number of not just defamation cases which are sort of seen as our press freedom kind of cases but also law and order related cases against journalists hmm. and which is why it's, it's increasingly becoming difficult. So to answer your question right now I think it's, it's uh, there are two three things to it. One is that as part of the new revenue model of lots of news organizations uh, because any kind of ground reporting uh, reporting requires some kind of budget to be able to go take a vehicle, go to a place, report, spend some time and come back. So as part of the cost cutting measures, anyway, news organizations are, are, are a little reluctant in, uh, you know, sending people out and to report. And apart from that, a uh, number of bureaus that a lot of news organizations used to have in various parts of the country, again, because of the new revenue model, the bureaus have shut down. So, for example, each state would have one now, but that is not any longer there. So, those the, the work that the bureaus would do in those states is being done by uh, independent journalists, local journalists, mm. journalists in remote corners. So, they bring in news, but uh, they bring in news, but they do not have the security of an organization. They mm. do not even have like a proper salary because it's all part of a gig economy. So mm. which is why it's extremely difficult for journalists to actually, when they are reporting on the ground and when it's local journalists, 
they are a lot of times reporting uh, and writing about the communities within which they live and which is why it's the 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 threat for them is closer compared to anybody who's in a in an, in an urban area or in a metro uh, politan city who comes and you know goes to a place reports and comes back uh so which is why it's 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 very difficult it's becoming extremely difficult i will just come to my experience but i think it's really important uh, for i uh, particularly for me it's really, i feel that yes uh, something happened with me and but having uh, so i'll just tell what happened that in the last since september last year i was getting a lot of stalking calls from number of uh, phone numbers all of them were internet numbers so each time i would block it was just, would just not help so there were 200 300 400 numbers and uh, there were three four different voices and they would each time somebody would call they would say that oh you were just buying vegetables in the market and i am going to come and throw acid at you and how do how you know you you, you know you all you the kya kitna bada reporter banti ho so basically you know you try to be the small reporter or something and the each time i would get a call they would exactly identify where i was so if i was standing in the balcony if i was out in in the market if i was at a mall if i was as a at a friend's place they also knew when my my uh, partner would leave the house and then they would call and say that that your partner has just left and he's going to this particular place and we are just going to enter and throw rape you or uh, kill you and all 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 the things that we've heard in the past but it was it uh, for me because in the last seven and a half years there have been and not just for me many other people this has been so, so it's unfortunate to say it's been so normalized in our lives that the only way to deal with it is to block it off because uh, earlier also even taking it to like a cyber cell or the, or the police hasn't really helped so the only way is to block it off and not pay attention to it and that's how i was trying to deal with it but then again because these calls continued and i kept blocking numbers and uh, kept getting calls from various voices three four voices uh, in Jan on january 25th again i got a call that somebody said that oh, uh, uh, your husband is not at home and you going i we just going to enter the house to acid and rape you and around 9:30 at night somebody tried to open the main door of my house yeah so uh, so i thought that my husband is back so i was try i thought i i called him out i called him and i then there was no response so when i moved towards the main door and i opened it by then that person had rushed i live on the uh, had taken the staircase and left so that's when i decided mm. i should go and file a police complaint and uh, put it on record it's not that i have great expectations from the police wanting i mean fixing it and that's how it turned out but uh, so then i decided to put it out publicly and also file a police complaint and it's very it's it's interesting that because that's when i realized that even so i as a person who writes in english and has my own set of privileges in many ways even for me when i went to file a complaint the, the cop said madam aapko behem ho raha hai so basically you were imagining things mm. so and it took them almost a week to file uh, an fir so that was complicated and uh, so, and it's been what it's been 7 months now but no charge sheet has been filed nothing has been done so so this this is something it happened with me and again it was it was a it takes a little bit of effort to walk on the road then and mm. to 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 tell yourself that oh the person walking next to you with a bottle water bottle is not actually walking with a bottle of acid wanting to throw mm. so it it is a bit wow. uh, uh, i mean you have to put an effort to calm yourself down and get on with life so that is something that happened but i want to say that again uh i again i think that i when i i'm privileged because when i say something or i when i ask when i put out something like this i do get support from some people within uh, you know people who are lawyers activists journalists but 
that kind of support is not extended when the same thing happens to local journalists, the ones that I just told you about, who are part of this gig economy. So, for example, uh, one journalist called Pawan Jaiswal, I don't know if you remember the story two years back, he had done the story on how the midday meal in UP uh, government schools, as part of that, yeah, uh, the, they are serving children roti and namak. And that's the report he had done. And once he did it, a case of criminal conspiracy was filed against him. And uh, like I said, that most of the journalists, local journalists are not given a salary. So it's obviously not enough for them to uh, uh, survive. And which is why Pavan Jaiswal also ra ran a grocery store in his house. Mm. So everybody suddenly disowned him and said, oh, he's not a journalist. He actually runs a grocery store. So there was some kind of malice. So that's when the things become complicated and it's so now Pavan Jaiswal unfortunately has left journalism because it's been mm. two years of you know dealing with a law and order related case mm. and that I think is becoming a big problem now for, for journalists on the ground because they have to bear the legal expenses they also have to fear for their safe like you know for their lives we've seen a journalist being set on fire in Sharjah two and a half years back we've seen uh, recent Recently in Ghaziabad, Vikram Joshi, he was uh, shot dead. So there are these things, but unfortunately, uh, the there is no political will and not, not just political will, our, our systems of governance, our uh, police, everything has become so uh, weak that there, there is no respite of any sort. And the people who do attack journalists enjoy the kind of impunity and because there's no action. So it's very, it's, it's very difficult then to work in the Can I ask you a question? And it may sound like a contrarian question. <laughs> and it is a very elite question. It comes from very elite positions, sitting in the cities, being an English speaking person, someone like me. I don't understand why they were so threatened by a story that said that you gave roti and namak. Right, or that they somehow the stories that seem to threaten the establishment, you think you're so corrupt. Okay, so I'm saying as an armed person, right? Yeah, like a, yeah. So I'm thinking everyone knows you actually are in bed with the gangsters, everyone knows that you are making money from corruption, that you're eating, but you get so angry about these stories that are like that journalists do that you think aren't even challenging your power. Like you could ignore yeah. those stories and carry on. So yeah. why does it get such a big reaction? Honestly, like even the Beti Uthao story, um, yeah. if you want to talk about that story, yeah. uh, which is about the RSS taking young children and raising them as Hindus in Punjab. I don't know if I know the states yeah, properly, Punjab, Punjab, Punjab and yeah. you know, in the Northern part. Yeah, Punjab and Gujarat, right? Mm. But I was saying to story Karbi, though, who's going to stop it? Like, what is the big deal? Like, and it was what 30 kids, 40 kids? Yeah, yeah. it wasn't yeah. as though it wasn't at a level of a Bofors, it wasn't at a level of like, oh, you know, you've eaten. But wow, what is it so threatening about these stories that they have such a huge reaction? They, you know, the Outlook editor in the end quit because of that story. Um, what is it that is the trigger? Where is the line? I don't understand where the line is. I think uh, I think it's very important to keep this in mind that the government and right now why I'm saying government and I'm not saying just BJP government. I'll come to state governments with other political parties. I think that hmm. I think uh, there is a, a concerted effort to be to to generate this kind of dismissiveness towards the press. Uh, which we've seen globally in, in some parts, but here also that, you know, you're completely dismissive. The fact that our prime minister gives interview to a Bollywood actor, but mm. does not have a press conference in seven years is, is the fact that they want to, it's not like they are scared or anything. They just want to put the attitude is that we don't care. Right. So the, 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 the attitude is that you to discredit the press. The attitude also is to say that don't trust them, trust us, our, our PR, PR machinery, trust our Twitter handles or whatever press releases we put out, but don't trust what people are 
something now. And this is the kind of template that has been created in the last seven and a half years, which by the way, all states are very happy to emulate. So for mm. example, during COVID-19 last year and even this year, there, were, there are almost 200 cases against journalists who were reporting on lack of oxygen, lack of PPE kits. Right. And this happened in Jharkhand, in Chhattisgarh, in Himachal Pradesh, in Maharashtra and various other states where the, the governments were uh, not BJP government, but other government. And right. that's why I started off by saying that everybody is very happy with this template. Mm. And the establishment is not, is not very, does not like critical press or press just does, or even the press that does their basic job. Mm. And so this is being normalized across states, across political parties. Mm. And that is what we should be worried about. So you think it's just a power thing, like you should not even question the smallest thing. Yes, yes. Because for the lack of PPE kit, lack of oxygen, the kind of acts that were invoked against journalists, like Disaster mm. Management Act, Epidemic Diseases Act and stuff like that. And so journalists who are just writing that, okay, there is no oxygen in this hospital is... Yeah, which is not... Out of mm. And uh, they are now dealing with cases. So it's not some big investigation. It's not like, you know, some, <laughs> something somebody has to resign. It's not that. It's very basic reporting of how the governance is failing the people and that is probably they don't want that so is, that, is that a strategy then that you don't even allow the smallest amount of criticism so then you don't have to worry about the big stories because if you yeah. crack down on the little ones right yeah absolutely you uh, that and so if you crack down track down on the little ones anyway the revenue model is such that it's impossible to do like a, like an investigation that requires you to devote two months to it and fact check and get everything that could be puts, like puts together a white story. But apart from that, even to read that is impossible. And now the bare minimum is not uh, allowed. And instead, like we, we've talked about it again, the kind of propaganda that is there on WhatsApp and stuff like that, that is taking over any kind of basic journeys. Okay, so we're going to go to um, Sangeeta, who wants to know, what are your thoughts on Substack as a new medium for journalists? Actually, what are your thoughts about how easy or hard it is to make any kind of money as a freelancer? Because Substack is actually, Substack, big, uh, you know, it's part of that larger question. Because yeah. Substack says you can, you know, write directly for your audience and um, make money directly from your audience. You're not dependent on an editor who can be fired or mm -hmm. whose editorial budget is shrinking. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that is actually there is a way for you as someone to directly do stories from people who can give you money directly? whether it's Substack or some other model? Uh, I think that, uh, so Substack is a great thing that people are doing it, but I, uh, it, it's a little more complex than that. The fact that, uh, so this is my ninth year of freelancing and I don't know that it's not possible to, you know, sustain yourself on the kind of money you get as a freelancer. But uh, I think the other complication also is that Substack, for example, for me or any other, the reporter who's doing like a uh, bigger story or we are unable I still feel that it's it's impossible let me put it this way I feel that a lot of news organizations that have money right now do not publish the kind of reporting that should go out and the ones who publish do not have the money and so which is why they do not have the resources for it to reach a wider number of people and that is something I struggle with all the time as a freelancer and which is the problem I also see with Substack. So I can write, but then if I, it is only reaching some certain people, that's also okay if those people are interested. But then uh, beyond a the point, there is limitation. It does not, uh, 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 what do you say, for, for a longer piece, for investigations and stuff like that, I don't think the reach is that much, which it should have. The other thing also that recently there is this discourse everywhere that uh, which money is important. Like I said, not possible to sustain yourself as a freelancer. 
so you always have to think of something else like i always like i always i figured within two years of freelancing that i have to also like teach or do something else to keep it going and yeah. that that is how i uh, operate but uh, the other thing also is that any kind of uh, journalism then has to be able to like there has to be enough resources even if i put it on substack only certain people who are paying for it are able to get access and how many people can actually pay for the kind of investigation and this is the conversation out globally then that the people who cannot afford to get verified news do they uh, not deserve it so no. that's also so that is also a conversation that is happening and and there is no like any well rounded opinion on it and we are all struggling with it with answers for this but uh, yeah i i we have still have to see and particularly in india and south what asia what is your ideal like okay now let's not talk about a government that doesn't or any kind yeah. of government do yeah. any other kind of party hmm. let's take that all aside hmm. and um if you accept the indian um environment to be the way it is Yeah. Because most media organizations are owned by businessmen who have multiple interests. Yeah. And because they have multiple interests and multiple businesses, they're easier to get to, mm-hmm. right? Ah, uh, they're easier to actually crack down on because if they're also doing coal and if they're also doing you know retail, if they're also yeah. doing whatever, you can raid them, you can shut down their other businesses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? so you come from a situation and people are vulnerable to begin with um what would if you had to say i wish neha dikshit had to say i wish what would you say i wish i had what in order to do the journalism i can because you're not going to get it from the government you're not going to get it from editors so what would be a direct way in which um you could make the money to pay your bills which i think is very mm. important and most yeah. people don't be respect to that right mm-hmm. they think somehow reporters should live on fresh air or something mm-hmm. um and yet do the journalism that is important mm-hmm. what would be that ideal situation look like would it look like a substack uh yes in a way yes but mm-hmm. i also feel that uh, uh inst- i i also feel that like lakshmi you've been part of those things and i also feel that there has to be a fund mm. that has that has uh, that gets the corpus and there is gatekeeping there instead of like a direct kind of thing and which mm. also means that there, there there shouldn't be just one neha dikshit there but there there should be like several people being able to do that and that is not the case right now for for local journalists for journalists who are not writing in english right and right. Uh, so yes substack is a good start but it has to be we have to think of more ways in in ways it can be inclusive and it can accommodate more people so it needs to be institutional a little more institutional like a fund yes. that yes funds yes. in general and funds yes. the kind of projects and not yes. just star reporters like a neha dikshit who's known yes. but also someone who's unknown and yes. has a really great story and is taking risks yes yes absolutely um so plessy is saying um hold on so he's asking plessy will you ask your question about uh, siddiqui he has a question about siddiqui kapan yeah plessy yeah where is plessy plessy is usually the first person in many of our i think he's dropped off no i'm still there but okay. i was talking with somebody else in place right. let's you want to ask your question there's nothing further i mean the question speaks for itself mm-hmm. uh, that governments are not even allowing uh, reporters to reach the source or where they should yeah. get the information from is it a thing that uh, because this in this particular case is it because mm-hmm. someone from the south came to report on something in the north or is it not like that it just happens in general is it the question. south north thing No, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, it, uh, it, it's important, but also we have to see what Siddiqui Kapur. Yeah, yeah. We also have to keep in mind that this is UP government, 
uh, where uh, Yogi Adityanath has even uh, sued hospitals that had put out a cry for lack of oxygen and patients dying. So people have been sued for that. This is also a state where people who had participated in anti-CA protests, their names were put out on hoardings in the capital city of Lucknow. So this is that state and which is why, it, and also the fact that in the last four and a half years in this state, there have been over 6,000 encounters out of which close to 200 people have been shot dead. So this is that state and so which is why uh, 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 we have to keep this context in mind. But having said that, it does make a difference that Sadiq Kapan, because he was coming from Kerala, and the fact that Hathra's case did uh, 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 did galvanize a lot of uh, uh, solidarity for the for the person who uh, uh, was killed, it did uh, uh, hold because Yogi government Yogi Adityanath government was held answerable for what was happening, and Hathra's case was not the first one before that. We had seen the Unao rape cases, two of them, where the entire family of the survivor had been, uh, you know, uh, is now no more. So, uh, which is why I think uh, that is something that we need to take into account. And the fact that he's been charged with UAP, Unlawful Activi Activities Prevention Act, which is again such a draconian law. So, yes, like I said, uh, uh, this... Yes, definitely, because he's he's in jail. It's the Hathras case happened in October. Now it's August, so it's almost ten months. So it's been a while. And again, Yogi government is actually taking it forward because uh, in a way like the template that I talked to you about, because they they are extremely dismissive of people. In I don't know if you remember in February this year when two journalists had reported on how homeless children on the streets were, uh, you know, uh, shivering because of cold. And so even to report that, there were cases filed against him. Even, you know, it's, it's blasphemous that you do something like this. So yes, uh, uh, that is definitely there. But I do want to highlight the fact that Yogi government in UP has been doing this consistently. And it's become increasingly difficult, definitely for journalists who are in UP to report and anybody want going from outside with resources, they are definitely opposed to it. And he was Muslim, right? Yes, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important. Yeah. With something, so Sarah, something like that, they did, for example, with Dr. Kafil also, because he was the one yes. in Gorakhpur, and he, he was charged with NSA, and he was in jail for, a, for almost eight, nine months, or even more. So they, they don't want this info, these kind of things to come out. So, so if I were to ask you a very brutal question, what is the probability if a Hindu and a Muslim reported the same story or a Hindu and a Muslim doctor did the same thing, what is the probability you'll end up in jail? Higher probability just because you're Muslim. Can you be? So, so the, the straight ans answer is a Muslim will be in jail. The straight answer is that because if you see even in like the police encounters that I spoke to you about, mm. there have been 6,000 police encounters and the only two times we've seen a lot of you cry about it is one recently when, a, when Vikas Tube, one upper caste Brahmin uh, person was shot dead. And uh, mm. uh, two years back, there was somebody called Vivek Tiwari who was a middle class upper caste person working for a software company. So it is, it is uh, very straight and it's out there that you cannot, if you are uh, a Muslim uh, journalist, it's extremely difficult for you to do it and escape uh, the prison or any kind of legal case of it. So it's, it's, the answer is straight. In fact, uh, Lakshmi, you told me about the Beti Uthau story, which the RSS, mm -hmm. basically the story was how the RSS was taking indigenous children from the Northeast and to uh, Punjab and Gujarat. So this is one particular case where I found that 31 girls were taken together between the age group of 3 to 11. And once the, pa the parents were told that they would be given free education and lodging, but once they were handed over, the parents just couldn't trace their daughters at all. So all the documents, photos, everything was taken away. And these are such remote areas that once you take away something, it, you, it's not possible. So the villages are in a way that you park your taxi and you walk five kilometers and then you reach that village. So that remote. And so 
uh, once this was put out and I gathered information where even the Assam Commission for Protection of Child Rights said this is child trafficking, you can't take them. Uh, and I traced the girls in Punjab and uh, Gujarat, 20 in Punjab, 20 in Gujarat and 30, 11 in Punjab, where they, was, they were not in a system of formal education, but they were given like bhajan classes and sanskar classes and how like the seven-year-old girl said that she wants to immolate herself to escape Christian and Muslim invaders and stuff like that. So basically all the, this kind of uh, fundamentalist uh, stuff. So even uh, uh, for that, when I did the story, of course, there were, there, are, there were three legal cases filed against me, criminal cases, and the cases are still on. But the fact that it was very shocking for me because a reporter who I very respect quite a lot, uh, 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 and he's reported for decades in UP, the Muslim reporter, he tur turned around and said that you were Neha Dixit, so which is why you could do it. I, as this person, and taking his name, which is Muslim, didn't, mm. he, he said that I couldn't have done it. And that, 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 that is extremely sad and it's extremely heartbreaking that we have come to this. And we've seen something similar last year in Delhi riots in February 2020, when some Muslim reporters were made to chant uh, Hanuman Chalisa and say Jai Shri Ram and chant Gai Tri Mantra and they were beaten up. So now if reporters are going on the ground and they are being attacked for their religion and for their community and their caste, it it's, it's speaks a lot about the kind of uh, country we are living in. Sarah actually has a question on this, uh, on this line. Sarah, you want to ask that? Yeah. So taking from the threat that journalists face, do you think it's moderately easier when you're with an organization as opposed to when you're an independent journalist? Or, so, uh, yeah. yeah. I, it's, it's again, it's again, uh, I would, I would like to say yes, but that's not the case. Because having seen uh, so many journalists in, in, in the last one and a half decades, 15 years, I see that there is the Indian news organizations have set a precedent for not standing up for their reporters, particularly helping with legal cases. So, for example, if you see the case of Shaina KK, who has been dealing with the UAPA case for 10 years, she used to work for Tehelka when the case was filed and even more, this is the 10th year, I think. But she's been bearing the legal expenses. Something similar happened with Samuel Matthews again from Tehelka. So these are the, and he had to, uh, pay for the legal expenses for almost like 15, 16 years. So this is the kind of thing that happens where, yes, independent journalists definitely have to bear the legal costs and costs and, you know, uh, 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 protect themselves. But the same kind of thing happens with reporters for news organizations. So we have, there are very few positive examples of this. And if you look at like most, I think 70% of the reporters are bearing the costs themselves. So Nivedita has a question about how this will affect the future of journalism. Nivedita? Uh, yes, hello. Uh, yes, Nivedita. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, uh, I just finished my final year from Delhi University. So my question initially was, how do you think all this fear mongering and this uh, cases, false cases against journalists will affect the future generation. Like I had quite a few friends who were pursuing journalism from my same college. I have a friend who's just finishing a final year. So especially investigative journalism, how do you think it will look going forward? Uh, Nivedita, I am very hopeful even when I've said all these like sad things, but the fact is that uh, the bad thing is that internet has really democratized mass media in some way. So it's not like if one major, some major five news organizations decide that, oh, we are not going to pay attention, the story will not come out. It will come out in some way, even if it's coming out on social media. And if people start responding, then people do pay attention. So that's one thing. The other good thing that is happening is that uh, because there is this kind of, it's decentralizing media. So the fact that people, we see more, uh, uh, you know, uh, news organizations, independent news organizations in local languages within certain areas working and that is, that is in a way a very positive thing because which means that people are coming together to write to basically report in 
in Gondi or fought in, uh, you know, in, in, in Bhojpuri. We've seen many of those grow in Bundeli, uh, in, in uh, Khadi Bhasha, in, in uh, West UP. So we are seeing that it has decentralized and which actually uh, is, is a very positive thing because the fact that there, there are so many cases that we hear of also suggests, suggests that people, journalists are not stopping, but they are continuing to do, do their reporting in some way or the other. So yes, uh, the, the, what do you say, the, the push to stop them is more, but that also means that as so many people are again continuing to do what they want to do in terms of reportage. So I, I look at it as a very positive thing. I have a follow-up question to that. Hmm. So this is my, maybe it's a flawed insight, Neha, mm -hmm. but I felt that the 1990s when they liberalized media and they made it a lucrative kind of glamorous even profession, right? You had the TV anchors and you have, you know, the star journalists. It attracted a lot of people who wanted to do journalism for the wrong reasons, to sort of stay in Delhi and stay in Bombay mm -hmm. and kind of become stars. Um, not really do journalism, in, which in India is a very unglamorous profession. The actual journalism is very unglamorous, right? You have to go to places where there are no bathrooms. You have to go to places where you better know Hindi or you better know the regional language. You better be able to talk to people. Um, even if you do data journalism in this country, it's, you know, the data is hidden in dreadful musty files where the numbers change all the time it's ground grinding work right it is slog work right do you think that liberalization in some ways um and the glamour of journalism and journalism being sort of positioned by a certain star you know celebrity journalist has hurt the profession I would totally say that because now, uh, even as wherever you go as a journalist, it's so silly, but wherever you go as a journalist and you have a paper and pen, nobody thinks, they said, oh, uh, are you from media? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I am, but there is your mic. So the, 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 what do you say, the image of a journalist is always somebody with a mic. And so, which is a lot of times when something is happening in a public gathering, people don't even want to talk to you because you have a pen pen and paper because there's no incentive to talk. But having uh, uh, said that, also I agree with you Lakshmi because it is about it, the television journalism and particularly the way it grew in India and now we have so many almost what 200 plus uh, news channels or even more if I'm uh, not mistaken. The, uh, the what do you say, the reportage has become, the, because we are living in such a binary situation where either it's this or this. So either you're a bhakt or you're an anti-national, there's no in between. So you know, mm -hmm. that kind of binary that has been created, I think that has also been created because of television journalism, which has, unfortunately, I have to say, no depth. So it is at a very surface level and there is no attempt to also uh, 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 explore what is happening behind the scene. And also, like we've talked about earlier, that all television news organizations have some kind of target audience they want to reach at the news organization I was working with, they wanted to reach urban uh, male uh, <coughs> audience, urban uh, uh, rich men, and particularly the prototype was a 35 year old techie sitting in Bangalore. So we were told, <laughs> so we were told that don't do these bleeding hearts back of the beyond farmers dying of suicide. Don't do all these stories, do stories on do investigations on, how, uh, who are the rich kids racing fast cars in South Delhi? I was giving that, given that idea. Mm -hmm. So that's when I decided, okay, I, I, I don't have the skill for it. But the fact that it has been, uh, it is so surface level and which is why the, the kind of discourse that has been created in the media right now, where again, you have to be, you either support this or you, you do not uh, mm -hmm. support it. Mm -hmm. And which is not the case with ground reporting, because if you have to speak to five different people on the ground, there will be five different kinds of opinions, which no. makes it more complex and more nuanced than no. just this or that. 
and so which is why yes great damage damage has been done something similarly is now happening with the the kind of twitter journalism or instagram journalism we see and i'm i'm not saying i'm not saying in a blanket way that it, it's a problem but i definitely face that now teaching students uh, teaching some journalism students and when they quote somebody's tweet in an article and i'm like no no that's not how you do it so uh, so it's a it's a big problem now and uh, but i think it's going to change because more and more people are like i said are reporting from various places in various languages so there are no 10 20 celebrities any longer I, because it has decentralized things there'll be 100 celebrities and that's always better than having 20 celebrities sure and you know in the end if if the right story gets out just for the wrong reasons yes. you said right yes 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 exactly um so sanita is uh, do you want to ask your question she 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 actually has a as a question that i want to ask you um because i don't know man how you do it but <laughs> she wants to know how you do it sangeeta yeah how do you i guess the atmosphere in india right now is just so um it's i guess it's easy to just feel very hopeless and you know you've been like persisting and reporting on ground reality so how do you stay hopeful um in this situation <laughs> uh such a complicated question you asked uh hopeful in the sense that like i said that uh there is any for anybody like i say for me as a reporter it's not like i exist on my own and i have all the strength to do it i want to say that there is a lot of support there is a lot of support that one gets from uh journalists from people you know seniors from people who are around you you know and that that kind of support and solidarity props up people to be able to do things and so which is why i want to say it's not uh, my hope is not individual it comes from a lot of people who feel hopeful around me and are doing their work in various parts in various ways as part of you know various cogs in the wheel and that's why uh, it's helpful so geeta i think you also asked about uh, the uh, uh, the indigenous children and how they yes. were moved in fact uh, out of those 31 yeah. out of those 31 girls 28 have been repatriated so they have finally they are finally back with their parents and also the fact that this is something uh, which needs to be reported because i remember in 2017 trudeau in canada had apologized for something similar that was done for to indigenous children in in canada for all most uh, you know almost 100 years uh, for uh, done by christian missionaries when children indigenous children were taken and they were indoctrinated in a similar way something similar that happened in australia by the way so uh, this is something that needed to be put out thankfully 28 out of those 31 girls are back of course it hasn't been uh, they haven't conceded that this was trafficking they've said illegal migration so not called it child trafficking but they called it illegal migration but the girls are back and that what, is uh, something to be hope you know that keeps you going in some way what, what what about something you know you did brilliant reporting on the muzaffar nagar riots right and that has honestly it has there has been no repercussions for people yeah, yeah. who did yeah. the killing there been no there has been no hope there has been no help for the people who are, who suffered how does that affect you when you went and you did such wonderful reporting you showed exactly what happened you showed exactly who did what and then you look at them now and it feels like there's been nothing so how do you get through that as a journalist Uh, uh it's it's again it's it's a little difficult because if uh, you know each time there is a lot of time spent doing a story which involves sexual violence or violence or any kind of you know some kind of uh, this kind of stuff involved it does you know chip off one one you know one part of you because it just uh, well, they're people they're human beings yes yes but uh, having said that also the fact that 
uh, one has to so it's difficult so for example the muzaffarnagar story that you're talking about where you know i uh, in the time that i spent on relief camp just to piece together how almost 100 women were mass raped during the uh, riots in 2013 in september oh. and uh, the fact that in one incident one village head uh, uh, misguided them and told them uh, that you know he will protect them but eventually 19 women were mass raped inside his compound and you know all kinds of things happened it's difficult but also for me lakshmi i don't know i think everybody has a different way of dealing with it for me i have to understand and i keep telling myself that this is not about me and this is about other people this is about the people that i'm reporting about and uh, also the a lot of uh, hope and courage comes from them because i go there i report and i come back and everybody reads and everybody's like wow what a story but the fact is that those people are uh, still living in the same vicinity as the accused a lot of these women that i wrote about are working class women who are working as farm laborers in the farms of the people who raped them and they have no option to move out of that place even after the relief camps were destroyed they had to go back to the same village and rent houses and go live there and they continue to live and that i think is far more uh, uh, you know it's 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 far more brave and inspiring that anything that we do when we report and like spending one month or stuff also yes nothing comes out of it i remember that out of those 100 women who were mass raped only seven went out and filed cases against the accused and now after almost uh, uh, seven years eight years only six of them were were uh, threatened again and again and they had to drop their cases one one of them continues to fight a case but she moved to delhi to muzaffarnagar uh but it's again uh, they are still there they are living there they are continuing with their lives and uh one te television journalism once i spoke to and i said this because this is this happened just a year after the anti rape movement in 2012 mm -hmm. and after the amendments were made in the rape laws the first for the first time a clause was included that acknowledged sexual sexual violence during sectarian violence so mm -hmm. the muzaffarnagar rape cases were sort of a precedent and I remember talking to a television journalist saying, why don't you do a report on this? And they said that it doesn't make for good TV because these women are not artists. Wow. So, so there, there you go. So which is why perhaps no momentum or no kind of campaign or any, any kind of buzz is made around these cases. But yeah, at least it has been documented somewhere and 100 years down the line, somebody will know that this also happened. I hope so. Yes, because in the end, the stories have to be told, right? Yes. It's yes. about bearing witness. Yeah. yeah. That's what you're doing. So Ragni has a question. Ragni, do you want to talk about, she's talking about how digital news has destroyed us all. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, since you talked about the internet uh, democratizing media, obviously with the internet, there is this big problem of clickbait journalism and how you need to get the clicks because we were also talking about how we can't pretend like journalists don't need to make money. So you do need to get clicks. Yeah. But yeah. obviously like in the name, don't, how do you feel clickbait journalism has impacted actual reporting and how stories are now being reported? And has it, has it? Oh, uh, okay. So and also the other thing I think with digital journalism to add on to what Ragini is saying is to get the story out first before you know the facts. Yeah. 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 Yeah, the 24 hour news cycle and all of that. Uh, so, uh, uh, Ragini, I, I remember I was doing a fellowship, and as part of that, I was placed in, in one of the news organizations, Newsroom, a leg uh, legacy news organization's newsroom, where I figured that they were putting out 300 articles every day, out of which uh, 120 were rehashed from you know various news agencies, PTI, Reuters, and stuff. But the rest of them were opinion pieces that uh, people who had just entered journalism with all the hopes of doing like good stories and making an impact, they were made to write two to three opinion pieces a day. Like how much opinion can you have in one day? It's impossible. You can't have that. So that is one problem. The second is I've heard that now in newsrooms, when the edit meeting happens in the morning, 
it doesn't happen on the basis of story ideas it happens on what is trending on social media so they mm. look at the trends and then they start thinking of a story around that so that that trend could figure in your headline and then yeah. somebody comes and clicks the third thing that i read which is really like strange and silly was that uh, a lot of news organizations put out these stories like you know 50 hot pictures of you know some actor some you know some some because mm. that is what people click towards the yeah. evening so that so they, that's your click bit so click bit is of course like there is a problem with it and uh, the fact that um, like lakshmi said that uh, they want to put out the story even before collecting facts is something that we are all dealing with and everybody replicates the same thing by the way yeah it's not like anybody is doing some exclusive stuff and giving us more information that is already available uh, people ha- start doing stories putting tweets of people which is already there on social media so that that is a big problem uh, and i also remember one major news organization one uh, would owned by again a big uh, uh, corporate house would each time they would report from india they would ensure that the that modi figures in the headline because everybody mm-hmm. clicks on whatever you <laughs> <laughs> so 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 that is there and i don't know how we de- how we are going to deal with it also the fact that now every headline has to be a question which is fine because i know that's how people uh, you know surf the internet which is fine but it's it's uh, sometimes uh, it doesn't fit in so it's a problem mm. and there is a lot of white noise on internet especially but i having said that then if some something important comes up people also pay attention to that yeah that's true yeah and it it does document it is archived somewhere so even i've also experienced this in, la- in the last 15 years that you do an investigative story for one news organization and that news organization collapses and your works your work is suddenly not available on internet but then because internet is like this that somebody has archived it somewhere and it will reach so that's the good part that's true thank you so do you think though there is a certain exhaustion because like sometimes like, okay this is my pet peeve right about like how digital news is mm-hmm. it's like in the old days when you used to go to sarojini market and then you you know there were the export rejects there's so much kachra 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 and you have to go through it and find that one thing that is actually yes. worthwhile yes yes you have to bury all the kachra Yeah. You yeah. should not be like that. Yeah. You should not force people to go through the kachra and to find that really great piece that deserves attention because all yes. the kachra actually takes attention away from the good journalism. That's what I worry about, right? And I think that's why I think uh, you know uh, focusing on certain you know are uh, doing specialized stuff. For example, explainer is doing specialized stuff. So anybody. who wants to know about an issue will come here and be like okay this is where i'm going to get all information verified information and i'll i, I can use but this from a perspective so we do like the best reporting so you don't have to go to the to the yes. Yes. Right? yes and uh, i and i also want to say that this is not just our big independent big media houses that are doing it even the independent mm-hmm. slash alternative news organizations that said that they're going to focus on something you know which the mainstream media is not doing even they are doing the same and even they are replicating the same thing no and that that's because we have a terrible business model right yeah. um we have a terrible business model which is uh oh it's all about clicks it's all about yes. whatever right it's about oh you it's better to get the close attention of 10000 people yes. than the passing attention of 10 million people yes right? yes but yes. that is not the business model the business model is just to have people you know they click and bounce out as long as they click that's what matters um adya has a really okay no first aryan aryan why don't you ask your question hello hi hi uh, hi i was uh, so my question is uh, we have a lot of i i have been part of and we have seen a lot of small media channels that do really good stories but 
on the other side there are channels like republic maybe or uh, that that would pose out big questions and they will have such huge trp ratings and people would watch it and we are literally seeing new channels being a part of segregation like they're trying to create like a segregation in in in, in views uh, so can can alternative media or independent media actually undo this sort of damage that's been done by the conventional mainstream tv channel media so i uh, according to so from how i view it the only way to break this kind of you know massive news organizations reaching you know uh, uh, you know the millions of people the only way to break that is that it becomes the 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 reportage that is done within one one area you know one specialized either it's one specialized area or it's one particular uh, uh, geographical area and that's where people i have seen this for example for example for khabar area people read in bundeli people only uh, trust uh, khabar area and to the point that now i know know this for a fact that even the local cops are scared of the khabar area reporters because they're going to put something out and and that is something that we are seeing that the only way to break this kind of hegemony and this kind of monopolization is to strengthen uh, news organizations or, or uh, you know in 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 specific areas build solidarity and build the kind of resources so that people can get authentic news about themselves things that they that affect them and not somebody sitting in delhi in the you know within the corridors of power but actually what affects them so the fact that there is no water the fact that there is no oxygen these things that affect their daily lives are reported and put out and there is far more engagement far more belonging far more ownership and i think that is the only way if we, if we work around uh, uh, communities in area and send in various news organizations they will automatically break the hegemony of these bigger ones so it's not like people will stop watching or republic they will watch but the people who actually matter and for whom journalism is supposed to be and uh, uh, they they will benefit more from this kind of stuff so adya has a question which is actually i think you know because she is going to uh, graduate school and she's going to study gender and media so i think this is a question very close to her heart this is also a question I... close to my heart huh, please go ahead <laughs> yeah i wanted to ask you um, how it was different for you when you study journalism in college in delhi versus actually doing on ground reporting do you think you were prepared for it and how you felt the first few times that you went um just a general understanding of how that felt like for you um so okay so i had no idea about journalism and particularly because my parents wanted me to do i am from that generation where all parents wanted you to do either medical or doctor or engineering or something and obviously i didn't want to do it <laughs> so so the, but yes it is different uh, in the sense that uh also i was just fresh out of college and this is in 2007 and something where you know suddenly i was like this uh, what do you say very uh, like super college fresh feminist and all of that and mm -hmm. you, i and i was in haryana reporting on khap panchayats and all these khap leaders are like you know women are like this and you how dare you also as a woman reporter roaming around here with this male camera person we would have just shot you dead and you would like cop leaders would say stuff like this and i would start arguing with them there and then i there was a point where one cop leader was like please go i'm not going to talk to you and i was like oh i just have lost the story and what am i going to say when i get back to the newsroom and that's when i learned that to, the only way to answer that kind of nonsense is to actually report come back write whatever you have to with facts and figures instead of standing there and trying to fight the cop leaders so that mm -hmm. that was like very real for me something so so that that is one thing also as a teacher of journalism i see i teach some students who have in some way not been exposed to to what do you say how do you say they they are very urban students and mm -hmm. i have had experiences of taking them to villages and i had to tell them that the only assignment is that you will not cover your nose oh really right? wow. yeah yeah so so that is also something that one has faced 
so it's 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 very mm-hmm. different but i think any kind of journalism can only be taught when you actually do it mm-hmm. so basics you can explain and something that you can learn on your own also in some way but uh, eventually when you start doing it is when you learn um and also just to follow up what's one what's the most important advice or something that you would say to young journalists in this time and age any okay. piece of advice or so one thing i have to say that to all journalists who want to or jo- people who are just entering the profession is that please be ready to do some really uh, boring stuff for the first 2 years and don't get disenchanted <laughs> <laughs> they've all been through it and if you brave it out then you'll have your chance to do what you want but first two three years uh, uh it's going to take that much time to actually reach a place where you can start doing the kind of stuff that you want to and then Thank yes you. there is censorship and all of that and all of that is there but there are also enough people to help you in some way okay so i'm going to ask the last question Okay, and I'm going to ask you a question that's close to my heart. That makes me cry. That makes me think that I'm old. I should just retire and go home. Which is, why do they get elected? How come they win elections, man? I mean, it's so clear. We do the reporting. We do the journalism. We push it out. It's so clear what is wrong. What it is clear what is being done is wrong. But yet, parties keep winning. Mm. So, is there a disconnect? Are we some weird Westernized sort of institution that we think that? Oh, you know, we talk about corruption, or we talk about rapes, or whatever. It'll move the needle, but the needle gets stuck at some caste calculation. It gets stuck at something else, and I think that is at the heart of my despair. When I can't sleep at night, when sometimes I feel so tired, and I think. and not just you know whether here I mean, that has happened to me in the us by the way right mm-hmm. i wept we did so much reporting on how george bush was lying about the wmds in iraq right yeah. and i was working in the us at the time we put out excellent reporting we put out excellent information and they still bombed and i cried the day he bombed iraq because i felt like all the work i had done was pointless and you know what he won the next election with a bigger margin and then i cried even harder right and i'm like i was like what am i doing with my life what is the point of this so how do you get through that i i i uh... again what what does one say lakshmi but the point is that i think also in all these examples where uh, right now we're seeing that uh, in uh, all over the kind of nation state argument that is put out that completely uh, uh, takes over everything else so the fact that uh, 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 you know the kind of nationalism that is there in our discourse right now which everybody should be a nationalist but who defines how you are supporting your what kind of country do you want also the fact that the kind of sectarianism that is so the george bush time was the time of islamophobia and something which again like spread all over and here again uh, back home we are also seeing something similar where which is the kind of sectarian politics that is out there apart from that the fact that yes in a way uh, uh, a lot of disenchantment the kind of problems that are there on the ground the kind of unemployment all of that uh, has been channelized into this kind of rabid kind of support for mm. certain political parties and probably th- that is where we have to stop responding to these kind of binary situations that certain political parties are creating as our discourse but break it and ch- change the discourse and probably that's where it's going to help also the fact that uh, from a parliamentary uh, kind of democracy we have sta- now started 
to have elections which are very presidential style where there's only one person and one party we are not that kind of country we are so diverse that if we if we also start reporting and writing in that way then it becomes uh, it, it 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 is definitely going to fail us also the fact that our democracy our democratic structures have to be strengthened enough for this kind of political party and the kind of resources so many resources that they have that with your it cell and with every elections we see how you know mps from this party to that party uh, all of that that we see i think that has to be broken when only when local issues are are taken up and we have to change the discourse as i can definitely say as reporters stop responding to the kind of uh, uh, discourse or narrative building that happens through uh, the propaganda of some select mainstream news organizations but build our own uh, 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 discourse in various languages and in various geographies and probably that is the I, but i it's definitely a long term fight it's definitely going to take decades i i hope it ends soon but uh, yeah it's, but do you think so then do you think that this sort of like um twitter we talking about twitter sort of yeah. the liberal echo chamber on twitter yeah. Yeah, very much about Modi, and it's about Amit Shah, and it's yeah. about you know, BJP at this very national level. Yeah, how helpful is that? It doesn't feel very helpful to me. No, uh, it is not helpful because okay, Modi and Amit Shah are there, but it's also RSS that yes. has worked quietly for hundred years. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hundred years in twenty twenty five, and uh, they have worked quietly. I was telling you about the Beatty Uthaw story. Uh, yes they are doing it but the fact is that 25 years back there were just 650 units of rss in the northeast now there are 35000 units of uh, uh, rss in the northeast so the fact is that they have worked quietly they are all over and we don't see that because we don't go to those remote corners where this kind of work is getting done every passing day so it's not very helpful to talk about modi and amit shah because also people are tired it's predictable arguments predictable uh, accusations predictable narratives and nobody even registers that any longer whatever is said on twitter uh, when we take it to common people so i think uh, uh, it's not helpful at all well exactly thank you thank you so much neha is wonderful and you've talked about such difficult things with such a big smile on your face <laughs> which i think is astonishing and more power to you every day i wake up in the morning and i think if they could be 100 neha dikshit india would be better for it you know and i'm sure they are um it's just that we don't know their yeah. names well right that i understand but thank you so much for thank being thank you so much lakshmi and i want to say this that uh, lakshmi is amongst the few people who 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 uh, reaches out and who supports so when somebody asked that question that what what's happening with press freedom i said that there are people already who support and prop you up and help you do your work so <laughs> lakshmi is the prime example so keep at it and <laughs> when my cover is saying whatever you want me i'll do <laughs> so i'm so proud of you and i'm proud of your work thank you so much for being thank with you. us thank you guys for all of you for being with us have a fantastic weekend thank you